Welcome back. So in this video, we're going to take a look at the pathophysiological differences between someone experiencing a stable angina, an unstable angina, and a myocardial infarction. So we've already gone over how people are going to end up with occluded vessels or occluded arteries that are going to lead to some sort of acute coronary syndrome. So what we're looking at in these patients is someone who's developed atherosclerosis as a result of high blood pressure, high cholesterol, diabetes, or the associated pathologies that's led to some sort of reduction in coronary artery lumen size. So what we're looking at here is the diagram of the heart. We can see our atria here and our ventricles down below. And what I've added for uh, the purposes of this demonstration is what we're going to use as the coronary artery or one of the coronary arteries. So you can see I've added a little piece of vasculature into the side here which is supplying blood to the myocardium and that's going to act uh, as a representative of our coronary artery. So we can see what's happening uh, in someone at rest uh, and while they're active who has stable angina. So in this video we're going to be, or in, right now we're going to be looking at someone with stable angina. So what's happening in a stable angina is that coronary uh, artery plaque or the atherosclerosis that we've talked about has began to build up and it started to occlude our lumen. Uh, as we talked about before, atherosclerosis usually moves its way out or towards the tunica externa before it starts heading inwards and, and actually decreasing that lumen size. So someone who has a stable angina has likely had atherosclerosis or uh, the contributing risk factors for an extended period of time before they end up. Uh, with these symptoms. That's why we often see uh, these types of pathologies occurring in middle age. So what happens is we have an atherosclerosis or a plaque that's built up in our coronary artery which is decreasing lumen size and as a result we're not going to get as much blood flow to the myocardium uh, than we normally would. So obviously we'd normally get 100% of blood if there was no occlusion here to this myocardium. In this case we've occluded the vessel or we've decreased the lumen size and we'll say that we have a reduction to maybe 60%. So we're still getting blood through, but now we've had a reduction in the amount of blood that's getting supplied to that myocardium to around 60%. So only 60% of blood that normally flows through that uh, coronary artery is now making its way to the myocardium. Now, in someone with stable angina, at rest, this reduction in blood supply actually is not going to produce any symptoms. And the reason for that is because we have redundancy built into the MVO2, or the myocardial oxygen supply that we need. Uh, so that's our MVO2. We have some redundancy built into our MVO2. We don't necessarily need all of the blood and oxygen that's making its way through the coronary artery to our myocardium. So this patient who say has a reduction to 60% while at rest maybe only has a myocardial oxygen demand of 50%. So while they're sitting and watching TV or working at their desk and they're not in any, any particularly stressful situations, this 60% blood supply or the 60% perfusion that we're getting to this myocardium is sufficient to actually supply the blood with the oxygen it needs while it's at rest. So although this patient has a reduction, is not getting nearly close to 100% of the blood that it normally would receive, this is more than enough because the patient's not doing anything. The myocardium isn't particularly taxed. And the MVO2 at rest, uh, so MVO2 at rest is much lower than it would be uh, while the patient's active. So again, although this patient has a plaque buildup, they have a reduction in blood flow to the myocardium, because the myocardium is not working particularly hard while the patient's at rest, the 60% is still greater than this MVO of 50%, so the patient doesn't experience any symptoms. The problem occurs when the patient uh, has some sort of activity, or we start to tax the myocardium. So stable angina is an angina that comes on while the patient is either stressed, has increased myocardial workload, uh, or is exercising. And those are the most common, exercise is the most common uh, cause of an increase in MVO2 in stable angina. So if we take a look at what's going to happen when this patient exercises, um, this 60% is no longer going to be enough. So we still have our plaque that's present uh, in our artery. So we have a plaque that's occluding our artery. This plaque hasn't grown at all, so it's the same size plaque. It's still leading to a reduction to about, say, 60% blood flow. And again, these are just arbitrary numbers to give you an idea of what's going on. 
So we still have a reduction in blood supply to the myocardium, or we're not getting as much blood to the myocardium as we normally would. So we'll say in this case, we're only getting about 60% of our normal supply there. But now you can see our heart is active, or our ventricles are contracting a little harder than they were in our previous diagram. And now we have an increase in MVO2. So as this patient has gone out for a jog or is helping someone move or is doing something taxing on the myocardium, what's happening is we're having this increase in MVO2. Or now, our, now we'll say our MVO2 has increased to somewhere around say 70%. So although at rest this patient only needed 50% of the blood supply that was making its way to the myocardium in order to have perfusion and oxygenation of that tissue, now, as the patient is doing something exertional, we're seeing that MVO2 rise above what's being supplied to the coronary or to the myocardium now. So our coronary artery is still only allowing for that 60% uh, perfusion or 60% blood flow to our myocardium. Well, now it's demanding 70%. And what's happening in this case is we start to see ischemia. Parts of the tissue are now going to have a reduction in blood supply, or they're going to not have as much uh, blood supply as they had before um, because we're simply not supplying enough oxygen and blood to those areas. The areas that are most commonly affected by a reduction in blood supply or ischemia when we start to have uh, blood flow that's not meeting our MVO2 is the inner portion or the subendocardial par portion of the tissues. So what happens is these inner parts of tissue start to have redu a reduction in the amount of blood flow blood flow and blood supply that they need, and they're going to switch to an anaerobic metabolism and start creating some metabolic wastes. And this is really the components of a stable angina. This is how a stable angina is going to occur. So a patient exerts themselves, they increase their MVO2 beyond what the coronary artery is able to supply because of their atherosclerotic sclerotic plaque. And as a result, we start to see some ischemia occurring. So this yellow mark that we have here is ischemia. So we start to see ischemia to the tissue. What happens when we have ischemia occurring is we start to see some release of metabolic uh, wastes. So we're having uh, metabolic wastes making their way out of this ischemic area due to anaerobic metabolism um, and the beginnings of cell death. And that's gonna, have, uh, that's gonna stimulate the patient to have chest pain. So the release of metabolic wastes into the surrounding tissue is what leads to the patient experiencing the chest pain that we know to occur in someone having uh, an ACS. So the type of chest pain that a patient's going to have with a stable angina, and this is true for unstable angina, myocardial infarction as well, is a visceral, uh, a visceral feeling chest pain. And a visceral chest pain occurs due to stimulation of autonomic fibers um, in this area where the metabolic wastes are being uh, released. So we have some damage to tissue and release of metabolic wastes. And as a result, we know we have autonomic innervation to our heart. These autonomic fibers are going to recognize this stimulation. They're going to be stimulated by the release of metabolic wastes and the damage of the attaching tissues. And that's what's going to stimulate this pain. And this is how we get a visceral chest pain. The components of a visceral chest pain uh, are that they are, uh, it's more of a vague sounding chest pain. So a visceral chest pain is going to be described as a heaviness or a pressure rather than a pinpoint pain. And again, that's a result of this autonomic stimulation rather than direct stimulation of uh, pain receptors. So we have a reduction in uh, coronary, blood, coronary artery blood supply which leads to ischemia of the, M of the myocardium when we can't meet this MVO2 that's raised during exercise. And as a result, we have release of metabolic wastes. And the patient begins to experience a visceral chest pain. We stimulate these autonomic nerve fibers um, and cause the patient to have pressure or uh, a heavy uh, aching sensation in their chest. This type of chest pain often comes along with nausea, vomiting, and diaphoresis. And again, that's related to the stimulation of these autonomic nerve fibers. So as we stimulate the autonomic nervous system, we start to have some of those factors that are involved in, uh, or that are controlled by the autonomic nervous system, 
uh, activated. So we start to see things like nausea, vomiting, and diaphoresis occur. Primarily because they're being stimulated by uh, or these areas of the brain that uh, are responsible for nausea, vomiting, and diaphoresis are now being stimulated by the activation of these autonomic uh, nervous tissues by the release of these metabolic wastes from our ischemic area. So we start to get a visceral chest pain. We get symptoms associated with autonomic stimulation, things like nausea, vomiting, diaphoresis. Um, and we also get what's called uh, a referred pain, or we can see a referred pain occurring. Referred pain is when someone's experiencing um, stimulation of fibers in one area of the body that's actually leading to a pain sensation somewhere else. In this case, we often have radiation to either the jaw, neck, uh, arms, or back. And the reason for this is because we start to see fibers, or uh, fibers that are responsible for pain transmission, synapsing in the same area as different uh, parts of the body. So if we draw our spinal cord, what's occurring when we have a referred pain is the fibers that are coming from the heart saying that there's something wrong or that there's uh, a pain sensation occurring in the heart are actually synapsing in the same area as the shoulder, um, the shoulders, the neck, jaw, or back. And when that signal makes its way to the brain, it gets misinterpreted uh, by the brain as a pain sensation that they normally experience. So, you know, people are much more commonly going to experience pain in their shoulders, back, jaw, neck than they are going to experience pain in their heart. So if we have nerve fibers that are coming in, stimulating this pain response from the heart and going up to the brain, what happens is, say we have something that's coming, or we have a pain sensation that's coming in from the uh, shoulder or neck as well to the same area that's traveling up the same tract. So um, say this guy's coming in from the shoulder, it's also coming in, traveling across, and moving up the same pathway as the pain sensation from our heart. As a result, when it gets to the brain, the brain does what's easy or what, uh, what it normally experiences when uh, it has this type of stimulation and it results in a shoulder pain or jaw pain rather than having a chest pain. So we're likely to see a referred pain with these patients as well. The important things to note about stable angina is it's normally predictable in nature. So someone with a stable angina is normally going to get this when they exercise um, or have some sort of stimulation or increase in myocardial oxygen demand. And when they sit down and rest, it usually goes away. Uh, for some patients, it, requ it, uh, it requires a spray or two of nitro to uh, allow for relief, but this pain is predictable in nature. They know that when they sit down and take a break, the pain's going to go away, or they know that after a few sprays of nitroglycerin, the pain's going to go away. So it's predictable in nature. And again, we know that that makes sense based on the pathology that we've talked about here. The patient sits down and rests, we're going to move this MVO2 back to our normal or back to the 50% that we talked about before. We're going to supply this area with oxygen again, and we're going to have a reduction in the breakdown of those tissues or the metabolic wastes that are being released. The pain is usually uh, short in duration, so we're usually seeing it only last 5 to uh, 15 minutes in nature. And again, that comes down to the po uh, point where people are going to relax or stop doing what uh, is causing the pain when it comes on, uh, or they're going to take uh, some nitroglycerin and it should go away. Any pain that lasts longer than 15 minutes uh, starts to fall into the realm of an unstable angina or potentially myocardial infarction. Someone who's having a stable angina uh, shouldn't have pain that's lasting really any longer than 15 minutes. And when we start to enter the 20 minute range, that's when we start to classify this pain as a unstable angina. We're also gonna see sympathetic nervous system activation, and that goes along with activation of this autonomic nervous system as well. So we're gonna see things like increased heart rate, increased respiratory rate, and an increase in blood pressure. Uh, 
as a result. And again, all of these things are going to hopefully allow for this patient to supply more oxygen to this tissue. If we increase heart rate, we're going to increase cardiac output. If we increase our respiratory rate, we're going to increase the amount of oxygen that's making its way to the bloodstream and hopefully increase the amount of oxygen that's making its way to the heart um, and meet this MVO2. So if the body's able to do that, um, we should see a reduction in symptoms um, that is common with someone experiencing a stable angina. So again, to kind of make this clear or go along with what we've been saying today, uh, stable angina occurs when we have a plaque or some sort of atherosclerosis in the coronary artery. What's going to happen is we have a reduction in blood flow, um, but at rest, this reduction is not low enough to not meet the demands of the heart. So at rest, we're still supplying enough blood to the myocardium in order to allow for adequate perfusion and meet the MVO2 demands of that heart at rest. The problem that occurs when the patient exercises or has some sort of stimulation uh, that increases their MVO2 is that this reduced blood supply um, or reduced coronary artery perfusion is not able to meet up with this MVO2. As a result, we get an area of ischemia or we start to see um, tissues resorting to anaerobic metabolism. We start to have some cells dying in the release of these metabolic wastes. And as a result, we're going to get the symptoms that go along with stable angina. These metabolic wastes tend to stimulate autono the autonomic nervous system, which is going to lead to a visceral sounding chest pain, which again is our heaviness or pressure or aching sensation that's difficult to localize in the chest. And we're going to see some of the symptoms that go along with uh, stimulation of these autonomic nervous uh, symptoms or fibers. We're going to see nausea, vomiting, diaphoresis. The pain is often referred or it's going to go to the shoulder, neck, or jaw. This is because the nerve fibers that are exiting the heart and going to the spinal cord in order to send pain sensation to the brain are traveling up a similar pathway or a similar area to those other areas of the body, the neck or the shoulders. And as a result, when it gets to the brain, the brain interprets it uh, as pain in the shoulder or the neck instead, um, or additionally, because that's where we normally experience pain as a result of activation of those fibers or that specific area of the brain. So we get a re referred pain as well. The pain is often predictable in nature and a short duration. So the patient often knows that they're going to get periods of angina as they exercise. Um, they climb a set of flight of stairs and they know that they're, uh, or they anticipate that they're probably going to experience some chest pain, but they know this chest pain will go away if they rest or take a couple sprays of their nitro. And it shouldn't last a particularly long time. We shouldn't see it lasting any more than five to 15 minutes because the body's going to induce mechanisms to try and increase our blood supply to the myocardium and meet this MVO2. So we're going to breathe faster, we're going to increase blood pressure and increase heart rate so that our output and hopefully perfusion increases. And as a result, this pain should dissipate. Uh, as well as if the patient rests or relaxes, then our MVO2 should go back to our normal level and they shouldn't begin experiencing uh, the pain that they uh, had. It's also important to note that if patients are experiencing more frequent episodes of stable angina, it could indicate that they're headed towards unstable angina or a myocardial infarction. It's important to uh, note that clinically, it's very difficult to differentiate between a stable, unstable uh, angina and an MI. Although these are the most common symptoms that go along with this pathology or stable angina, um, patients with MI can often uh, present with the very same symptoms. So it's still important to make sure that we're doing 12 leads uh, and the hospital will follow up with blood work to make sure this patient's not having myocardial infarction.